This episode, I'm joined once again by Tim Themi to discuss his book, Eroticizing Aesthetics in the Real with Bataille and Lacan. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Tim Themi, thanks uh, once again for joining us on Amidic's podcast. Thanks for having me. We are going to be discussing your book, Eroticizing Aesthetics in the Real with Bataille and Lacan, which was published uh, last year, 2022, by Roman and Littlefield. Uh, and this is a book, as people will imagine, about uh, the overlap or the, the a dialogue between Georges Bataille and uh, the psychoanalysis of Jacques Lacan. Uh, and it touches on taboos, to a certain degree, the strange atheology of Bataille, uh, all kinds of psychoanalytical strangeness when we mix all these things up with Bataille. And it also brings in Nietzsche, Freud, of course, and is is a just really a fantastic book. And we'll probably touch on some of the things that we touched on in our discussion, which was really an overview of the work of Georges Bataille. But this will likely be more focused on, you know, the psychoanalysis and Lacan, of course. Uh, but before we um, really dive in with these ideas, uh, just tell us uh, a little bit about how this book came about? The book, I would say, came about through the previous book, which was my PhD on um, on Lacan and Nietzsche. I started off being a PhD on philosophy and psychoanalysis, and then it got narrowed down into uh, Nietzsche and Lacan, like choose a key figure from philosophy, a key figure from psychoanalysis, so it's Nietzsche and Lacan. And then, you know, like they do when you're doing a PhD, it's like more focus, more focus, narrow it, narrow the focus. So then it became specifically on the topic of ethics, bringing together Lacan's ethics of psychoanalysis and Nietzsche's critique of Platonism, which was a critique of the denaturalizing uh, of natural values, which he thought Christian Platonism did to us historically. And by bringing those two together, I noticed there was a lot of um, similar things that Bataille was doing as well, which I wasn't able to really explore in that PhD, which became the first book. Um, and I wanted to then like extend the first book in that Bataille direction, which became the second book. So it starts off with uh, analysis of eroticism, so the connection between ethics and erotics, which is – you know, it's sort of definitely there, even though it hasn't been explored uh, terribly much, because the ethics of psychoanalysis is an ethics of unconscious desire, the unconscious polymorphous perversity of the drives, what Lacan you know, sometimes calls the real. And yeah, to go there means stepping through all these taboos and prohibitions, means transgression. That's an erotic process. And so that's sort of like ringing to me about what Bataille's is trying to do. And then it's there with Nietzsche as well, and the, he wants to re reevaluate denaturalized values, go more deeply into nature. What's there? Basically the Freudian id. So we have this sort of like process where we're being alienated from historical process, we've been alienated from our sexuality in particular, and then we're going back into it through all these taboos which have been held in by anxiety and shame, and that's basically what Bataille is saying eroticism is. And uh, so is Lacan in key moments of his um, ethics seminar, which is no surprise because he wrote it two years after Bataille published um, his 1957 uh, eroticism. So I wanted to explore those uh, those kinds of connections. Mm -hmm. And is, is there, I mean, of course, there's the biographically, there is a direct relationship, but is there a direct relationship between these two texts? Did Lacan ever sort of hint at any point that he might have, you know, drawn directly from the text, from eroticism? That's not really Lacan's Lacan style, is it? Uh, especially <laughs> when it comes to, comes to Bataille. But there are a, a couple of sparse references to Bataille and Nietzsche, which I seized on and made use of. Um, and but it's it's more like just the, the choice of topics. Like if you've got a section in your ethics seminar called the jouissance or enjoyment of transgression, that's got Bataille written all over it. And then at some point he does actually mention Bataille and the engagement with Sard. Um so and uh and then I think it's in the uh, anxiety seminar, maybe a few years later where he makes reference to Bataille's story of the eye, talking about the um, 
you know, it, it's it's read as an erotic novel, but it also expresses a fundamental uh, anxiety that characterizes our our times. The anxiety that sort of holds in taboos that we want to transgress in order to recover the fullness of sexual desire, but we are but we're unable to. And that's the sort of anxiety that's playing out in the um, the kind of a uh, persecutory, persecutory eye or persecutory gaze that sort of floats metaphorically through the text. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think to, to to sort of give ourselves this foundation, which you know, I put it in here in brackets for you, and unfortunately, I imagine for you, this is sort of like Lacan 101. But as the title of the book, in the real with Bataille and Lacan, uh, just an overview of this uh, Lacanian imaginary, symbolic, and real, so we we can get our bearings here. No, all right. So um, I'll do it in a in a in a Batillian way, okay. in, in terms of Bataille's historical, anthropological sort of. Um, uh, way of framing uh, uh, these three fundamental aspects um, of experience. So here we are, we're cavemen, uh, we're animals, right? And um, we want to get ahead. Yeah, we're sick of being beaten by other animals, by rival tribes, smashed by the weather. So we figure if we put taboos on parts, key parts of our animality and we control our impulses a little bit more, we've got more steady state, uh, more steady state consciousness, more time to calculate, work things out, cause and effect, form custom laws, reason, govern in a more or commune in a more sort of um, stable, productive way. And this is basically the symbolic register of language where we articulate things in more detail, including theoretically in causal relations. And that's done by putting taboos on nature uh, especially on those parts pertaining to sex and death, and that's basically the key aspect of the real. Taboos on the real give birth to the symbolic. Uh, one of the fundamental ones is the taboo on incest that you know, Freudians and structuralists like to talk about, Levi Strauss, for instance. But then what happens to those pent-up drives in the real? Well, they come back in the imaginary, uh, and the imaginary was the time for transgression of those taboos when that drive comes back, and that sort of really generally happened in the realm of, of religion. Religion, aesthetics, ritual, intoxication, dance, uh, all the arts, um, that was a time for um, transgression of taboos, of taboos that are on the real, where the symbolic takes a break and now we play in the imaginary. So the symbolic and the imaginary both are ways of engaging with the real, mm-hmm. but uh, re- referring to different sort of uh, fundamental moments in our kind of a daily or weekly or monthly life. Mm-hmm. So it seems it seems from that uh, description there that we're more emphatically involved in the imaginary, but we don't really know what it is. Oh, um, or am I completely off the mark? I think I would say the imaginary comes more when it's time to celebrate or take a break from work. Mm-hmm. Generally, for example, like we might do something related to the arts. We might do something, um, pursue something sexual, um, go on a date, or we might drink, or you know, um, or you know, for those who are still religious, they might go to church or be part of a church uh, f- festival or fete. So, I would say that mostly we're in the symbolic, where like you know. Watch out for the rules. Don't drive too fast. You know, make sure you eat moderately. Um, you know, happy, healthy, work well. You know, that sort of Tom York thing, like a like a sort of Android machine. Just um, that's the symbolic. We can communicate. We're moral. We um, obey all the rules until it's time for the instincts to get a free play. And that's generally, say, the weekend or the holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where it would be more the imaginary. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not as if the two are intertwined. It's just a sort of difference of emphasis. And actually, one of the complaints that uh, Bataille seems to make is that we've got these two domains a little bit too mixed up, mm-hmm. where, which speaks to perhaps what you're saying, where when we're supposed to be rational according to symbolic rules and laws, we're actually acting our fantasies mm-hmm. or being the, the, the sort of tools of ideology. Um, and when it's time to sort of like um, relax and expend in some leisure time, we're sort of um, watching sort of art or movies that's actually like a moral lesson trying to reinforce <laughs> the taboo that we're there like during, during the week. Um, so, 
Yeah, so I think things have sort of changed, and this is why I wanted to look at the genealogy of the erotic that Bataille um, kind of fashions and also all his interventions into aesthetics, all his analysis of artworks and his own uh, artworks, which are really sort of a fascinating intellectual episodes for us. So what does it look like when the real appears? When we finally end up in the real? When we finally end up in the real, uh, it can happen uh, in a lot of different play, in a lot of different domains. It can happen with a lover, um, sort of engaging in transgressive erotic acts, um, saying and showing and doing things we might not normally do, certainly not at the office or in the classroom, um, but even things that are all, even at the edge of our articulation or we might sort of have a, a fetish or a preference but not fully want to connect it to where, what the origin of, of that is, you know, it's sort of right on the edge of the, on, on the real. Uh, that's one example. It could be in the arts, um, experiencing a, a great work of art. Um, so Lacan used the example of a uh, Sophocles Antigone, um, where the turning point in the play is when Antigone starts, uh, or her father is invoked by the chorus. Her father, of course, is Oedipus. That means transgression of the taboo on incest. And then when she starts complaining that she's going to be sentenced to death and she's no wedding day, no bridal hour, only death will be my groom and dower. Uh, the, uh, she starts glowing. It's like this beautiful young virgin is going is to be, is going to die. And the chorus are like you know, visibly sort of like moved by this. So there's the sexual desire there as well, which sort of invokes the real, the need for the chorus to suddenly shift the kind of um, waiting from Creon to Antigone. And uh, then the gods come out and Tiresias calls it. Creon, you're wrong. You're, you're, you're too fixated on the good. You left out the real. And this is a tragic work of art where we're going to express that and also enable you to sort of vicariously enjoy that real to a certain extent and some articulation of it. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to jump forward a little bit in my in my questions because, in a way, I'm really eager to bring this in because I think, and I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about. So this is basically my favourite anecdote from... Bataille's biography, at least the Michel Serco one, which is sort of the go-to one now. Um, and there's a lot of anecdotes to pick from in Bataille's life, right? But this very, from a very, very young age, and he's very, very young at this point, I should have noted how old he was, but he was still around his father, so very young. And he overhears his father say uh, when mm -hmm. his mother is ill and the doctor has to come around and the mother and the doctor are in a room with the door closed and he's just tending to her as a doctor would. And Bataille's father says, doctor, let me know when you are done fucking my wife. And for me, this is like what we're talking about here is because Bataille's father at this point is fairly mad is for Bataille, this immediate acknowledgement from a young age of being around someone who is almost like maddeningly in the real, but they don't really want mm -hmm. to be because he's, he's blind, um, often covered in excrement, can't tend to himself and really just seems to be in this solitude, which allows him well, allows him to really just do what he wants, but then he doesn't really have any means to really control the real, right? So it's just like, well, this is this is what I want to say. You know, there's little things we want to say at the back of our mind. So, but why wouldn't I? Um, and it, would you see that as like a key moment in Bataille's life of like, this is what the real looks like when it when it finds a, a vessel? Absolutely, yeah. That is that is straight in the real, as well as the early experiences he has of his father urinating in the bedpan with the um. His blind syphilitic eye just gazing upwards, not knowing that the young Bataille was sitting there watching him pull out his schlong and like, you know, like let let, let it rip. Um so like when all the taboos and on nudity are being installed for a little child and they're very curious about sexual difference. And of course, uh urethral eroticism sort of emerges from that point. Like uh, why does it sound different when boys and girls do it? Why do their crutches look different? When can I have a peep? You know, look at the sister, look at the brother, look at the mother and the father. So that's sort of a way of once the taboos are in, reaccessing what's been prohibited is going is a returning to the real. And the striking thing about the um when you're done fucking my wife call, um, is that it it has some uh, articulation about it too. Like um it's not he didn't just walk in and see the doctor fucking his mother. He heard his father say it. So it sort of directly undoes the sort of desexualizing kind of attitude that one can have towards uh, the one that can exist between the the mother uh, and the child. Instantly in that moment, the mother also becomes 
a possible whore, right? And that is like back in the real life. My mother is sexual. Maybe she's even perversely sexual. Um, and, for example, the later novel of Bitai, one of the ones that was uh, only came out posthumously, uh, My Mother, in that one the mother has direct agency of sort of letting the son know, actually, I know you thought I was this pure victim of your father's excesses all your life, but now that he's dead, I'm telling you the truth. I am an absolute whore. I am the biggest perverted woman you'll ever see. It was all my fault. Don't blame your father. I just wanted it to be, you know, this way while he was still alive. And then she's basically like uh, grooming him to have sex with him at the end, have sex with her own son, a massive violation of the taboo, and then and then commit suicide, which is sort of, but not before she's basically initiated him into this sort of world of perverse S and M kind of polyamorous sort of uh, uh, kind of um, delights. But yeah, but that, but that first one about the, the one that you're mentioning about the, the let me know when you're done fucking my life. Like Batai says that. That was what led me to like want to find an equivalent in my in my life, in my work, and in my writing, and it's literally the basis of story of the eye. Like, and why does he want to find the equivalent? It's because the shock of the real can be traumatic. We're a sort of passive victim of it, and according to the sort of like tendency to repetition, we like to sort of repeat and play with it until we master it. Um, for example, this this is sort of basic Freud in um, Beyond the Pleasure Principle when he talks about how you you know a child gets taken to the dentist and cries and hates it but when they get home and they're playing with their friend with their friends straight away they're like let's play go into the dentist I'll be the dentist you're the patient it's their way of mastering the experience enjoying it playing it and Freud even like extrapolates from there to tragedy saying like how do these horrid themes which spare the um, audience no discomfort still get experienced as pleasure and this is what like Nietzsche is about too he's saying it's because we're able to master that fearsome real, that traumatic experience of the real and become masters of it and even get pleasure on it, but uh, do it so that, so that we get pleasure out of it. And that characterizes strong subjects, strong epochs, strong cultures, if it's allowed to um, um, emerge. So Bataille's doing this, but he's doing it in a much more sort of like way that you can do it after Freud mm. and that's way more sexual. But then again, he's also has sad... Um, in his background, which Nietzsche could have gone to too, but didn't really. So there's something Sardian, especially in these in the early battalion of the twenties, about what he's doing. Do you think we can ever fully master the real? What would happen if we were to do such a thing? Or would that be perhaps entering into sort of a psych possible psychotic fantasies? Because you have to you're then disregarding the symbolic, right? The symbolic sort of keeps society going. Uh, we need these. Yeah. We need these rules and laws, and there, there are of course these taboos that have been put in place by whatever various institutions. But the rules and laws need to be there. So to truly master perhaps your own individual, your own real, would uh, doesn't look all that good. Or is it possible? No, is it possible? But we would have to. We would have to take the symbolic with us. Put it that way. Like the mastery would have to be a, a very like a robust. Uh, Acknowledgement, articulation, um, uh, theorization of what the real is generally in the human condition and what ours is specifically in our own personal history, and then have really like a well structured outlets for it in the imaginary when the right time is there to do that, which still happens within a symbolic frame. For example, you might go see a film where somebody kills someone and you're vicariously identifying with the hero. That's different to like grabbing a gun and going outside and killing someone in, instead, right? There's, it, there's almost nothing nothing in common except you still do get some satisfaction out of, some response out of it if the right meaning there, if, if, if it's done in the right way. Um, and since that's where sort of um, the, the practice of sacrifice that was the cornerstone of religions, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, in a sense, uh, and Bataille points this out uh, specifically, becomes the sacrifice of the hero, where if the hero wasn't going to die, if Antigone wasn't going to die or whoever the hero is, if Oedipus wasn't going to suffer some terrible misfortune, you'd probably be bored and wouldn't be watching it. Um, but it's done in a certain way where you get to enjoy that reel, but still uh, without abandoning this, the, the symbolic. So we can master it by better understanding, um, which enables us to fine-tune the taboos and make them work uh, not, in a, not in a too excessive way, 
So that's that's the sort of complaint you get from Nietzsche, Freud, Bataille, and Lacan that we've overdone taboo historically th- through the Christian Platonic dualist turn mm-hmm. um, in religion. And so when it comes to transgression, it's sort of it's a little bit messed up, and our transgressions seem to be as uh, excessive or as messy as our as our taboos. Like too much taboo means too much return of the oppressed in a blind, uncontrolled way. So we needed to basically loosen the taboos or open them up so we could have more understanding of the real so that we can have better outlets for them and also enable more outlets for them. So we don't go around and say, let's ban porn and all nudity in movies and have everybody being as pure as the like, you know, as Jesus' disciples or Socrates in the Agora. Well, okay, where are we going to get our outlet you now at work when we're voting for aggressive foreign policy? Because th- that's the sort of thing or when we're being like under the guise of being uh, moral, we're kind of you know, demonizing people who aren't as repressed as us. That's the sort of uh, kind of sneaky way where where the real gets its outlet um, if we haven't really formed a symbolic mastery of the real that enables those um, imaginary outlets. And there's a whole story of how capitalism tries to exploit um, the perversion, if you like, of our relation to the real. Um, by making making sure that when we do transgress our normal taboos, what we're doing is consuming their products so that they can make more money um, mm. by buying their crappy food or um, consuming corporate or commercial products or uh, hugely commercial works of art, which teach us almost nothing about ourselves um, mm. or with a human condition. It's just about them making more money. And also when, when it's time to get back to work, like, are we really respecting symbolic taboos or are we actually an acquiring and accumulating uh, resources and reserves or are we just being exploited again because what gets produced is being taken by the by the bourgeois and funneled off to those tax havens, um, which gives them more power to corrupt our democracies and then uh, reinstall that sort of whole corruption. So that speaks to sort of a, a, an issue you wanted to raise uh, later about like, you know, what the relationship between capitalism and sin is, mm-hmm. is that, um, our transgressions still have that that character of being something sinful, and for like a number of uh, complex reasons. Is a is a transgression you f- feel to use you know sin guilt? Is a transgression you feel guilty about different to a transgression you sort of just completely open yourself to? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, like um, so. The shame and the anxiety are, are, in a sense, always going to be there because we're not always in the real. So we're going back to it, mm. something we usually sort of tuck away, right? Our nudity, for example, or our sexuality. Um, but yeah, if we if if the culture is more like, but that, that's okay, you're allowed to do that. It's perfectly acceptable um, in the right moment. Okay, if what the right moment is gets increase, increasingly narrowed, like you know, it might have been in a sort of a, you know, historically under certain you know, religious structures like sex can only be uh, if you're married and you're and you're trying to have a child between a man or a woman in the missionary position, you know, so, <laughs> you know, doggy style or light spanking or, or you know, you know, using like uh, naughty naughty phrases for each other. None of that, right? So, um, so obviously we can do more, more things sexually without experiencing guilt. But there's there's things where our, where our transgressions, like if they involve, uh, say, the games, right, going to watch the football, or um, or going to the movies, or um, or consuming various products, where um, the 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 productive process involved in producing these goods and services is full of like just disavowed crime. Um, sometimes I use the example of these wonderful, say, computer products we're losing, we're using right now. Um, it's great. We get to have conversations, which may include some enjoyment of transgression. It's not great. This sort of disavowed transgressions is the, the sweatshop workers or the terrible environmental practices or the, um, you know, the suicide nets that used to be around the factories or the Foxconn workers in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in China. So there's a, there's the sin, not, there's those sorts of sins, like there's sort of disavowed transgressions, which are horrible. And then there's um, the, our, the way our transgressions are appropriated by this process so that uh, – and Bataille really talks about this too, especially in um, the new book that's come out, The Limit of the Useful, which is a sort of 
early unpublished version of the accursed share, where it's really kind of um, honing in on this point. It's like we all invest in production, right? That's the Calvinist sort of uh, thing. All right, who's going to consume the goods? Okay, so when it's time to sort of uh, take a break, you got to like buy all the shit that you just made so that we can make money out of it. And so, but we're not really getting a sort of sacred moment of transgression where we get to go deeply into the real in a way that teaches us um, something more about the deepest level of the human condition. We're there to serve the utility of the bourgeois master. Mm -hmm. It seems to be, you know, there's a lot of, uh, especially sexuality, that's been sort of captured by capitalism and marketed in certain ways. And I think it seems it seems to uh, render the transgression impotent. It's almost di- becoming difficult to see where the truly transgressive lies anymore. Where do you where do you where do you see the, the like genuine transgression? What I mean, in a way, actually, what are the th- what are the things we what are the taboos and transgressions which might make people, you know. Uh, their, their stomachs turn as they used to in the old day when I don't know when someone saw an, a woman's ankle. What are the <laughs> uh, what are our our equivalents? It seems we we are sort of we've become beyond them, but there must be some still around. Or are we or has capitalism sort of made it seem like we're beyond them? Yeah, it's a uh, the, the two things come to mind. It's like one is the sort of uh, where perverse openly perverse transgressions take place for example in uh in the sex industry mm. right so in the in the realm of pornography internet porn uh to a lesser extent um uh, sex clubs um but there's a real ambiguous relationship with capitalism and those and those industries where for example in australia it's practically illegal to make pornography uh if you're making a uh sort of something that can be counted as feminist porn or queer porn, you can do it because it counts as education. But anything heterosexual, anything with a man in a slightly dom position, and that doesn't even have to be like, you know, whips and chains. No, you get shut down and you've got to go overseas or not, or not do it at all. Um, and there's real hypocrisy with the banks too um, where they really penalise sex workers and won't they, they won't take their money like they've suddenly got morals, right, the big banks, the big <laughs> corporate sort of uh, 2008 crash-causing banks suddenly have morals when it comes to people using their bodies consensually for sex, for the pleasure of of, of others and for their own um, financial rewards. So it's there, but it's also hidden hypocritically. And well, meanwhile, things like in social media or the movies, we've got this sort of, you know, what we talked about uh, last in our last discussion is the sort of the new Vic- the new Victorian era where it's like, you know, complaints about the gays and uh, Me Too and uh, and uh, so nudity has got to be minimalised, it's got to be objectifying, it's always the woman, she's got to be as pure as Mary or she's being harmed, um, you know, even change her pronoun, you know, like just, just wash away any sort of sign of sex to make us this, once again, this purely deceptualised, denaturalised uh, character as part of the old sovereign good of Christian Platonism, but there's a point where that good itself becomes transgressive when, like, this hysteria takes on it's about sort of cutting down people's enjoyment where the only enjoyment they can have is to, like, prevent someone else's enjoyment. So there's a sort of disavowed, sneaky transgression uh, going on uh, in there, which, you know, calls to mind the old witch hunts and the crusades and the inquisitions, get kill the infidels or the non-believers or the impure ones. Um, so there's, yeah, so that, that, that sort of binary, that sort of stark binary opposition is almost like this psychotic split that exists in the realm of aesthetics today mm. to do with, um, a kind of perverted erotics that we, or perverted relation to erotics that we have going on. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. It, it appears that, uh, contemporary aesthetics then have, have, there's sort of um, a little game they're trying to play where they're trying to display the real, but actually it's symbolic. They're, they've they've abided by a lot of created rules and laws around, you know, what might be appropriate or how things should be displayed. And it seems, yeah, it seems to be um, negating the, the the real that should be there. And so, what would what would uh, a Bataillon version of this look like? I guess it would look like the 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 story of the eye, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. So. 
and this is part of his, his fantastic interventions into aesthetics where even uh, Paul, his, his friend Breton, sort of like got under the battalion blow t- torch for a while for being too Icarian. Like, even though he was using psychoanalysis, automatic writing, free association, it was to sort of fly too high into the sublime. And so Bataille's strategy there was to sort of, you know, in a Freudian sense, so your sublimations are flying too high, I'm going to bring it right back down to the disavowed roots and point to the shit stain on Icarus's uh, trousers or his wing, for for example. Um, so, so that's what Bataille wants to do. Like when when he feels like the art is getting too neurotic, is reinscribe perversion there, reinscribe the real, and say, okay, that's a nice scene between the doctor and the mother. Let me know when he's done fucking your wife. You know, or, you know he's repeating that sort of uh, moment from his own history as well, and he's repeating what he learnt and stabilised during his his uh, own analysis. Um, so there's more real, but it's but I think there's also um, it's more articulated because of the psychoanalytic stuff as well. Like he's he's got a fair idea of what the partial drives and what the partial objects are, what the taboos are, and what kind of transgressions give the right amount uh, of release. And he sort of in, investigations into the history of anthropology, eth- ethnography, the lectures of Marcel Mauss were also very helpful for him in that respect because um, it becomes pretty obvious that um, uh, religion was a time to sanction transgression. With Christian Platonism, it's a time to uh, re-establish or reinforce taboos. So we have a massive shift there, and that's where the loss of eroticism takes place. I use the example in um, Tears of Eros about, um, uh, say, before Christianity, eroticism could be expressed and affirmed, right? The veneration of the genitals, the body, the, the penetrati- penetration act, not limited to heterosexuality either. I could say, for example, you think of ancient Greece and Rome. Then you cross cut to sort of like uh, the sort of Christian era where artists had to work for the church. There'll be nudity, but it'd be someone eating their own hand or vomiting or there'd be horns coming out of their head and they'll all be burning in hell. Um, and you can sort of see resonances of that uh, even in, in movies where um, sexuality will be really repressed and hidden, mm. but uh, you can have a slightly attractive actress stabbing, murdering and killing people or same with an actor. It's like uh, the violence is allowed, but sex is somehow even more violent than the violence. So sexual acti- expression is way more prohibited in, in mainstream sort of aesthetics than, than actual violence, which is a striking uh, kind of um, uh, perversion we have going on in this, in this domain. Perhaps, perhaps we've uh, we've already touched on this a, l- a little bit, but there's this connection between, you know, as you mentioned there, you know, someone can get an axe through the head, but show show some sexual stuff. It's like no, 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 you know. So there's a strange there's a strange cognitive dissonance there, but it does, you know, show this this notion that taboos are directly connected to the erotic, and I guess in a, in a Lacanian sense, what is it about eroticism? Or bringing both Bataille and Lacan together, what is it about eroticism, which is clearly more of a taboo, and that doesn't even really make any sense, more of a taboo mm. than these other things, which we we you know when speaking about them as we are now, you can acknowledge, yeah, like someone in a in a movie in a film like gunning down hundreds of people, and we don't bat an eye, but then it's you know shield shield the child's face when it comes to whatever it might be. What is it mm. about the erotic which seems to uh, ruffle our feathers? More than anything well, else. Apparently, we're so piss weak, we wouldn't be able to control ourselves. You know, <laughs> like uh, we need to, we need to stick a stick a burka around like every every film and every every social media platform to to protect us because the desire. And look, it's it's very true that the sexual desire is, is very strong and powerful, um, and it can be hard to sort of like concentrate on select problems of logic or abstract metaphysics and philosophy if you're, you know you've got some porn running on your desktop. <laughs> it's like yeah. Can't do it. That's uh, too distracting. Um, so, but that is also because we prohibit it so much. So we kind of like by by damming up the tides, it builds up a little bit more. And by being so prohibited and, and unacknowledged publicly, we're also you know, and, and we also kind of feel guilty, shame, and anxiety about it too. Which means we don't really articulate it in a you know in a, in a properly positive or affirmative or accurate way. So. 
we're kind of a little bit um, uh, behind the times when it comes to trying to deal with sexual expression. And you see culture tends to sort of like bounce between a bit more liberation then back to more prohibition, a bit more liberation then back back to prohibition, and it's sort of like a like a seesaw or a pendulum that's not really moving anywhere. It's stuck. And that, that's why I think it's really important to bring people like Nietzsche, Freud, Bataille and Lacan who are different but also similar together to sort of shed mm. um, some more light on, on this issue in the hope that we could secure what progress we've made and try and go a little bit further with each, with each passing uh, epoch, each passing year. In that sense, do you think do you think we've become our own priests? You know, as you see that the taboos, uh, from what you've been saying, taboos have really been built in in this Bataille Lacan sense from the Christian Platonic tradition, which has come in and you know sort of applied its own ideas, laws, symbolic reality to things, and we moved through to a secular society. Many people would say. Um, Ben, and yet this, you know, it's almost like even though there might be in many countries, obviously you've just made it clear, not in Australia, in many countries mm-hmm. now there is a, a you know, a open access to as many erotic, every kind of erotic desire that you'd like, yeah, even brothels, um, you know, very easy and open access to that. And yet can can you basically have full access to it and even perhaps increasing public acknowledgement, but some sort of kernel of a taboo in the notion that this is still a transgression has got hold in the sense that people would still be policing themselves with regards to entering into you know this acknowledgement that oh this is still this still shouldn't really be doing this i guess even when you are in a very open society or when it's a very open society or an open subculture within a society the society itself can still be closed which we sort of already already discussed which gives you the feeling or gives one the feeling that we're still transgressing Sure, we can go to a sex club, but uh, we're not going to carry the stamp around us uh, all, all day and show it wherever we go, you know, <laughs> like at the office, at work. Um, sure, we can download some uh, internet porn is freely available in Australia, but there was a um, a whole political debate about 15 years ago whether one politician wanted to bring in a filter to stop it. It's just production we can't do here in, in Australia. Uh, we can't make it. We can watch it as, as much as we want, but we can't make it and we can't really acknowledge it publicly um, without sort of suffering some marginalization or some weird looks. Um, so in that, when you do have a subculture where it is freely open, like in you know, a sex positive, porn positive, uh, polyamorous swing community, for example, or when, or when producers of content are, are involved, there still are plenty of taboos, uh, going on because it's not necessarily the case that anybody's just going to have sex with anybody anytime. Like there's still like, you know, uh, I've hit, I was listening to a podcast yesterday. Podcast when they're talking about, you know, trying to meet people with apps, and it's like, ah, oh, the when do you answer? When do you not? You know, what if the guy says this? What if he does that? Or what about the small talk? What about you know, are you single? I'm single again. I've got a partner. Or how does this work? So there's all these different sort of rules that get constructed. Um, there's always going to be rules against uh, nature to a certain extent, because. Um, uh, or else the, or else the, the whole productive capacity would break down. There'd be no symbolic, would be weak. Uh, we wouldn't have services at all and we'd be ripe for, um, overthrow for whoever was, um, not doing that, a neighboring tribe or, or, or group. But if everybody did it on the whole planet, well, you know, and everything was ro- roboticized so that we didn't need to work. Yeah. It would just be a matter. Of, I think it just would just be like athletes. Like um, you do what you need to do to recover and then you go again. Yeah, it's like you have your rehab and then you have your uh, uh, match time and obviously you sort of reach a peak in some sort of age groups and then as you get a bit older, we might move to other sort of uh, coaching roles or, um, or uh, you know, facilitating in other, in other ways. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, just to uh, bring both figures together, I guess, sort of more concretely, how does this Bataillian notion of entering into the real, which we've now discussed in depth, how does this connect with, you know, moving from Freud into the emphatically Lacanian idea that the unconscious is structured like language? What role is language playing in the real which Bataille is seeking to enter? Yeah, that's a good question because um – um for us to put 
a taboo on something, we have to know something about it. What are we going to prohibit? This act, this act with this person, not that person. Um, why? We're going to come up with a reason why. Um, so we're already articulating things in language. You know, when you say to your kid or when someone says to their kid, uh, you know, you can't play with yourself like that when you're in the car or when you're at school <laughs> or when we're at, you know, visiting houses, but why not? And it's like, okay, here it goes, you know, let me try to explain this one. Just don't or, you know, but language gets involved. Mm. Or when, and when the child first starts to get curious about what the difference between the mother and the father is or between the sexes are or where babies come from. So this this the, this realm becomes articulated um, sometimes better, more well articulated than than others, depending on the person involved. Um, but it is articulated. So when it gets prohibited, it's sort of it is to a certain extent uh, grammatically structured, structured like a language, and that's sort of what the can means when you're conscious, structured like a language, and also that it, that it comes to us in our dreams and surprises us as a rebus. So you might not see a penis going into a vagina or an anus. It might be you know a train in a tunnel or a shoe and a slipper. Um, and it comes in sort of in, in symbolic code because that's us, that's us trying to repress it, but also what's repressed trying to get through. So it's like a little compromise, uh, formation, uh, which is why Lacan says at, at one point, um, that, um, uh, when we repress something, it, 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 it's, it's not the end of it. It comes back as something else. It comes back, for example, as a metaphor, the train in the tunnel. The shoe, uh, the foot in the shoe, and um, playing with these sorts of metaphors uh, and metonymies can be very important for sexual practice as well. You've seen the like um, all the focus on the phallus that comes with um, certain dress, like the the long stockings and the suspenders and the, the garters and certain body shapes and tones. Um, and since they're all sort of speaking to a repressed curiosity or desire that we once had as children, and that was just like damn down and dampen down and like forbidden ushering us into a latent latency phase until puberty comes and like says, oh, they same old taboos aren't going to hold anymore. We're ready for uh, young adulthood. adulthood. But um, as Lacan says, unfortunately, high school is not designed uh, for us to jerk off under the best possible conditions. So there's still plenty of prohibitions still in place. You got to sit there in your school uniform and your shirt and your, you know, and the heat on their shoes and like, you know, rote learn mathematics or algebra. And so, um, yeah, so the prob that the repressed material is, is to a certain extent articulated. And one of the striking things about, um, the psychotic subject for those who get into that side of Lacan seminar three, um, is that there's something that wasn't quite articulated, which is the, the fright they experienced at sexual difference and the thought that this must be because there was a castration. The woman had hers cut off, which means the boy can have his cut off. Um, if that wasn't articulated, uh, probably because of like fear of losing one or envy, feeling that we've already lost ours and it's not fair that someone else hasn't. Um, then that's when the psychotic sort of process can can kick in. It's like uh, that emotion was so intense that the in initial articulations didn't take place. So that repressed material that's structured like a language is structured like a language that's missing a few key key terms, which is why instead of like, oh, that person looks interested, um, I wonder, do I like them? Should I wave back or smile back? It's more like, what do they want from me? They're out to get me. Yeah. There's, there's God's in on it. God hates me or it's the CIA or like, and the, the poor things are just suffering all these sort of paranoia and persecution. Um, so it's, it's structured like a language. And for most people who don't have a psychotic structure, um, they can work it out with the proper education and, and uh, encouragement, which we don't always give them in our sort of, you know, traditionally very uh, taboo stricken society. But for the psychotic subject, it's uh, some, something happened at that early stage where, um, like uh, Schreiber, for example, the famous example um, that Freud analyzes of a psychotic judge from Germany, um, he sort of has this thought that it might be pleasant for a might be pleasant for a woman to be receiving the phallus in in copulation. Um, is that such a um, is that such a striking or transgressive thought? That women like being fucked by the fellas. 
put a bit more like striking wit. It's like, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, what if you go into a certain like, you know, into a me roll, me, me too rally and say that, <laughs> so, okay, now you're going to get beaten over there with an umbrella or something, right? So it can still be very, uh, uh, you know, very, a struggle for children to understand these natural desires and instincts when adults have such prejudices and phobias and, and ressentiments uh, about them. And sometimes for the child, it just, doesn't happen for happen for them, and so this material comes back, and it seems uh, persecutory. Someone's persecuting me. I'm being uh, tortured. I'm being tormented, and um, it's a real uh, challenge for the uh, for the analyst um, to try and work with them. But Lacanians have had good success, I think, um, working with them and just reading their psychotic delusions as a text and trying to help them stabilize it. Um, so it's not so extreme and leads to bad consequences instead of just going straight for drugs and telling him, just forget it all, it's all crazy, just to try and work with the sort of text and help them analyse it and recover some of the material and maybe structure it just a little bit uh, better than it otherwise was. In that in that sense, moving, you know, these persecutions move towards like a psychotic, would you perhaps see Bataille as like the anti-persecution because he grew up in such a, like, you know, as we've already mentioned about his father, he grew up in that environment where he's like, look, this is just all here. You deal with it. But all would that would be its own form of persecution, but it's anti-persecution. So it's like, you're way too young to, to d- know even how to deal with any of this. But he's like on the other end of the spectrum, just not knowing what to do with it in that sense. So he's almost like too much information. Yeah, he got too much information, which is why he um, – he actually reacted against his father's sort of lewdness um, by trying to become a priest, which is you know, the ultimate sort of uh, trajectory towards re-establishing the sovereignty of, of taboo. Um, Catholic priest as well, which means no sex at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what he did for And he said it, it was – he says it was a reaction against his father's atheism, but of course also the the unrestrained nature of some of his – mad acting out, which you can sort of sympathise with him too. The guy's got syphilis, he's bound to a chair. Um, and uh, wh- what's he going to do? Like, the, the, let me know, doctor, when, you, when you're done doing my wife. It's almost like um, that sort of Lady Chatelet's lover, the, the start of that has a sort of similar plot, doesn't he? Except the, the husband isn't, isn't mad or syphilitic. He's just in a wheelchair and can't function. So he tells his wife to, yeah, I can see you eyeing off the garden. You know, just go for it. And uh, hey, Garner, let me know when you're finished with those hedges. You know, like, but this was done in a much more mad, direct way, which shocked the young Bataille. Plus, also seeing him nude, uh, urinating so openly, um, basically spying on on his on his dad. That's part of the part of the eye. His memory of that. Um, so yeah, he wanted to react against that for a while and reestablish the taboos and come to a better. Um, balance and to stop going, letting that become excessive, where the taboo starts aping the very drive it's supposed to be kind of opposing by becoming more extreme and more violent and more cruel. Um, it was Nietzsche who said, he, who he said, saved him from that. And then, so of course, you have to go back to too much real and work through that, through his analysis, through his work. And but by the time you get to, I've been saying by the time they get to the end, like uh, of his work after the war. There's a real maturity and a stability there, Mm -hmm. which I think was always there right from the start. But um, uh, it's just, I guess, you know, part of becoming becoming older and more mature. There's we're a little bit more familiar with all this stuff. We've been exposed to it much more, and like for that generation too, living through World War Two would have been, you know, that's the horror of the real. Mm -hmm. Um, And even World War One, they had childhood experiences of it. Um, Just all those like dead bodies, just a like in Limit of the Useful, he, he, uh, Bataille um, quotes uh, Junger, like his description of all the dead bodies that are piled up on top of each other. You're always stepping on them and like when you're digging a trench, you're digging through rotting flesh and the smell comes and the, the flies. and the. I've, I've seen descriptions of um, Gallipoli as well mm. um, with the Australian soldiers were going through that and uh, that is uh, an, an absolute uh, horror show. So, um, yeah, when we've been exposed to the real directly, we become a bit more used to it. Sometimes we can react by then going too hard for taboo, but over time we can also try to seek a better balance as individuals and also as a as a culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You just jumping back a, back a little bit, you mentioned 
um, you know, Pataj's sort of move away from his father, this reaction against his father and move to, I think it was Dominicans to become a Catholic and also to become, you know, Catholic priest, which would mean like the ultimate reaction against this thing he's seen. But what role is God playing for Lacan? And then what role do you see this as, you know, what's the like Lacanian analysis of Pataj's uh, re- quick retreat to God? Yeah, well, for, for Lacan, the God is connected to the uh, the paternal metaphor and the name of the father, which is what sort of breaks the sort of diet with the mother, where the child might think uh, he can have the mother or she can have the mother. But it's the same for the little girl who begins with the mother as the main object of of desire, and and the father comes along to say, well, no, actually, this is the sort of basic Oedipal structure. Uh, she belongs to me. Um, so, and there's a sense where the father is a sort of separation from that initial sensual material somatic bond by being a bit more distant. And this is where the symbolic uh, kind of structures can start emerging. There's a taboo on incest. It's a taboo on ownership of the mother. Um, this requ- requires articulation, more separation from the mother. You're not the same body. Um, you know, you're separate people, you're, you're a different subject. And in a sense, God is a sort of the Christian God, the name of the Father, because Lacan obviously lifts that term from, um, from Catholic, uh, Catholic doctrine, isn't it? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy mm-hmm. Ghost. Mm-hmm. So he takes this and makes it a kind of, uh, concept. Um, but it doesn't have to be God for, for everyone, the paternal function. Um, uh, as long as there is some kind of name of the Father, Happening there, and it doesn't actually have to be your own surname either. But that was one of the ways that established who's related to who, so who could have sex with who without it being incest and, and frowned upon. So the that's sort of where the the guy story and the name of the father kind of come in to sort of create the sort of the, the sort of right distanciation from the mother, the mother's desire. And it's not just the desire for the mother sexually, but it's also the mother's desire, for example, to make the child into her phallus. To fulfill her lack, which sometimes she would try to do, and, and uh, whether unconsciously or not, which can lead to um, sort of a uh, symptomatic sort of um, formations in the child, phobias, um, envies, um, which can play out in um, in later life. So, for Bataille, um yeah, I guess he 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 has paternal failing from his own father. Right, his father can't really be a stable, stabilizing third player in this mm. in this sort of in this relationship, the three of them. So he seeks supplement first in in the Christian tradition. Then uh from his studies sees that it's going too far in the taboo direction, too much distance. So then he gets back into Nietzsche and then anthropology to find a a kind of a more kind of balanced relation between the taboos on the real and times for transgression where we can go back to it. If it doesn't have to be our actual mother, but somebody who looks a bit like her when we were 14, maybe, you know, or um or uh, or just any sort of thing in their sensuous, material, natural world. Which of course the father has access to as well, right? As connection to as well. Like it's still his phallus coming from his body and his gonads and his and his semen. Um but the the maternal bond is the one that seems the most physical and sensual for the child because we actually grow up in there when we come out of there from that you know our first consciousness and words and uh, um come in relation to our first food source for example it takes a while for the child to realize that that breast is actually somebody else i realize this when i cry and i want it and it doesn't come you know or when i or if i cry because i'm like I'm cold or, you know, I accidentally kicked the cot, my leg hurts, and mother comes and sticks a breast in my mouth. It's like, well, I wasn't even hungry, you know. So you can sort of see how that one plays out in um, bad oral habits in, in later life. It's like, I don't know what's wrong, but I'll just stuff my face with something and then I'll be, then I'll be fine. You know, it's a sort of an old habit that can sort of uh, be awakened by doing that. Um, maybe I opened up too many cans of worms uh, in, in that answer, but feel free to take one and, like, uh, fling it back at me and we'll quickly. And we'll go well, I think the, the big, the big kind of worms for me, in a way, is is another question that I had because you mentioned Nietzsche in there as this, you know, 
Patai goes too far in one direction towards too much taboo and Nietzsche sort of brings him back and he thanks him for this. And you mention in your, in your book, you know, it's, you're talking about Bataille Lacan, uh, but you also have Nietzsche Freud as this also other clear moment in history, both having a dialogue. And what do you think the move from Nietzsche Freud to Bataille Lacan is, if that could be such a thing? Do you think it is to do with language? Uh, yeah, I think with Lacan, definitely. Because um, we're sort of moving from the Germanophone context of late 19th century, early 20th century, um, a little bit of, you know, Freud did some, obviously, some quality work in the interwar period as well. Um, moving from there to sort of uh, across the Rhine to sort of the Francophone context where Bataille and Lacan come a little bit later. Like, I think Bataille was born in. 1897 from memory or and Lacan 1901. So they're still like you know, little babies by the time uh, Nietzsche, just as Nietzsche passes away, having stopped writing 10 years earlier. Um, so it's a slightly different context. It's, they've seen World War I now, like um, uh, in, 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 in Bataille and Lacan, they've seen World War I they're between the wars and then they've seen World War II, which, of course, Nietzsche saw none of that, although he saw signs of it in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, and Freud obviously saw World War II coming and got rescued by Princess Marie Bonaparte and taken to London for his, uh, uh, for his later years. Um, so there is a, there's a different context there. Um, but then there's different influences. So for example, the whole formal, formalism and structuralism, this is something that Lacan w- was part of that, uh, that wasn't there when Nietzsche was around and, uh, and, wasn't something Bataille took to as much, although structuralists and post-structuralists certainly enjoy parts of his work. For example, the linguistics of a uh, linguist tricks of a story of the eye, the metaphor and autonomy going on there. Um, and Bataille was engaged too as well with his analysis of Levi Strauss, who was sort of like a formal linguistic uh, structuralist, sort of like um, a final take on the great French sociological tradition, um, which began with uh, Durkheim and, and moved to, to Mauss and then the whole College of Sociology with Bataille, Léry and Kawa and Lévi-Strauss uh, afterwards, after the war, which is what Lacan was mostly engaged with, Lévi-Straussian sort of structuralist reading of Freud. So that's where the emphasis of language comes. It's it's the the rise of structuralism in, in Paris, which... Uh, um, which Nietzsche and, and Freud in the Germanophone context uh, predate. Now you could argue that Freud could have got into could have got into linguistics or Syrian linguistics and stuff if he wanted to, but um, it wasn't really his uh, his emphasis. He, he was he was happy with condensation and and displacement to understand the, the dream work and uh, yes, yeah, so it's. You know, whether you think Lacan made great advances by bringing in formal linguistics um, or later mathematics, that, that's still an open open question. Um, if you're if you're a linguist or a, or a maths major, you might enjoy seeing it in that way. If you're not, if your background's more in you know the material world or, or the arts, you might not really care for it as much. And um, I don't know, I don't know if it really helped turn psychoanalysis into a science, mm-hmm. uh, an absolute like proven science, which Lacan, I think, was hoping for, but also at, at times acknowledges, uh, yeah, no, the real itself cannot be mathematically uh, kind of um, formalised completely. And you can see but early Bataille sort of saying, you know, I told you in 1930, you know, you, you can't just put a frock coat on, on all that is, you know, that's that's the sort of uh, academic sort of uh, prejudice to think it can reduce the real to the symbolic. And so then Lacan starts talking about the whole and the symbolic where the real is there and emerges and sort of surprises us um, in various ways. Will we ever be rid of taboos or transgression? Uh, no, we, we just could have a better relation, a better relation to them. Um, yeah, which is sort of the aim uh, of, of the book, uh, I think, in, in, in many ways to show how capitalism sort of inherits this sort of um, doctor or distorted taboo transgression relation and we're still uh, struggling with it. And this in particular comes out in the later Bataille sort of emphasis on the art politics uh, distinction, mm-hmm. 
where he wants the arts to be more about transgression and politics to be more about taboos, where he thinks we've got that a little bit mixed up, where art seems to have a sort of a Puritan moralist sort of dimension to it, and politics, instead of being rational and symbolic, it's uh, ideological and imaginarized. Um, you know, when fascism comes along, it makes it obvious, so or quasi-fascism, you know, like marching bands, little blonde dolls at the front. Even Trump came out with these, like, little twirling blonde girls doing the twirling. You know, they look very nice. Would have been, would have made a nice, like, porn parody, but in real life, in the, in the seat of the greatest empire the world's ever known, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, it's like, save it for the arts, you know. Play with stuff like that in the arts. Like, this is uh, politics. We want people who are going to be rational and practical as part of that pra- practicality. So... There's also a space where we're going to leave for the arts, for that sort of artistic play, for that moment of transgression. So Bataille is really keen to get that sort of relation between art and politics back in the right spot. Um, and what I did at one point was trace it back to sort of Nietzsche's complaint about uh, Plato wanting to ban Homer from the Republic. Um, they're saying Plato versus Homer is the true antagonism of, of Western history. Uh, Plato wants Homer out because he represents heroes and gods having passions, having emotions, being sensuous and erotic and sexual, and that's no good. We've got to make, you know, poetry, the arts, pure, like a kind of, you know, like a proto sort of Bible, right? That's that's the model for the arts, not the raging Achilles, sexually attractive raging Achilles and he's like lamenting, wailing because his like boyfriend died, you know, and or because um, you know Briest's sort of the lovely cheeks was taken from him by Agamemnon. No, this will not do. No. So that's where um, you know one of the origins where we got this thing wrong. But then there's also the critique of of communism or of Marxism that Bataille has, which I argue as, as still a Marxist and as still a communist, I think is very important as a kind of non-puritanical leftist, um, in what I call Bataille that, where, um, you know, just as, just as he tried to sort of oppose, be a thorn, thorn on the side or in the pride of surrealism by re- revealing its dark roots, um, which he tried to deny, he does that with Marxism too, in a way, to say that um, we need to really enhance the influences here, bring in some French sociology, some psychoanalysis, so that we do have... Uh, more of a space for the for the arts, for for transgression, for erotic transgression, um, so that the desires, sexual desires, can express themselves. And he quotes a, he actually quotes a surrealist at one point having this um, realization by saying, "It would be a radical socialist stupidity for us today to forget to leave a place for a Nietzsche or a Chester or a Dostoevsky or a Rimbaud, uh, etc., etc., etc." Um, yeah. So the art politics distinction, which is also a relation parallel to the relationship between taboo and transgression or symbolic and the imaginary becomes very important for the uh, mature Bataille. I'm going to assume you don't see that art politics distinction heading in the right direction. Ours, no, no, I don't. Uh, what we look at, look at our, our political system today. It's like, I can't believe they're trying to bring back in austerity. Like, uh, uh, you know, like they're doing it all over the Western world. We already suffered so much in the 80s from, you know, the Margaret Thatcher, uh, Ronald Reagan thing, which we had in Australia too. And of course, uh, recently with the Euro crisis, the sort of Merkel Schäuble destruction of Greece, uh, and, and all the peripheral, uh, nations of, of Europe, the, you know, the further exportation and flattening of wages for their own working class. Uh, and now we've got to accelerate again more higher interest rates to catch inflation, but no one's closing the tax havens. It's sort of, yeah, it's like we keep paying. It's like the, the bourgeois are like the super ego where the more and more you like renounce your own surplus to give to them, the more they demand from you, the more power they have to demand from you. And that's basically what the super ego does is at a moral level. It's like not only do I not have sex, I also lash myself for even having the thought. A super ego is not not good enough. Go harder, which they can do because where's all that energy, all that repressed sexual energy going to go? It gets played out in this sort of like super ego moral good figure, which starts becoming more violent and cruel than what we're supposed to oppose, what it's supposed to oppose in the first place. That's the Nietzschean bad conscience. That's the Freudian super ego. 
and that's our that's you no, know, you could say that's the clergy of the Middle Ages, and that's today. That's that's our bourgeois, our, our billionaire class, our one percent. They um they're not gonna they're not gonna spend. They're not gonna recycle any surpluses. And this is what Bataille sort of he's not outright dismissive of Stalin, even though he's like critical of the communist asceticism because he's saying that pressure in the Cold War led to the Marshall Plan, led to the West trying to actually, all right, we better recycle recycle some of our surplus to raise the standard of living just so that we keep people on our side and, like, stop them all from falling to this evil thing communist, called communism. Meanwhile, the communists wanted, like, they knew, like Lenin knew from Marx that we can't become a communist society because our productive capacity is too low, but we'll start here and then the West will fall and then they'll help us. And so then we had this sort of structure where, the Western oligarchs double down on the sort of capitalist taboo, saying, no, nah, all the money's got to go to us. We can't have, like, too much equality. And, uh, and you know, st- Stalinism turned into a horrible Orwellian police state. So, um, but the important thing that um, Bataille points out is that Marx and, Marx and Engels knew that communism should not be tried in agrarian societies, societies that weren't very productively advanced because – Whenever that tries to happen, no one has the right level of education or in the right level of productive capacity. And so you get the crudest asceticism that you'd ever want and also really like um, excessive primitive accumulation where they're trying to catch up to the rich countries and be able to defend themselves. So things like sexuality or eroticism or subjectivity or contemplation or philosophy, and this is what Bataille is talking about, that all gets told to wait, come back later. And of course, it never does come back really. Um, the same sort of austerity um, just sort of remains uh, entrenched. Is there anything you'd like to add about your book that you feel we've uh, feel we've glossed over? Uh, maybe maybe something on Blue of Noon in the final chapter mm-hmm. because um, I think that's an excellent example. Even though it was written in the 30s about the Spanish Civil War and um, not published until 1957. Uh, I think that the, the three feminine relationships that the protagonist, uh, the male protagonist has really speak to or crystallize metaphorically the problems we have with our politics relation today. So you've got the character of Lazar, who's loosely modeled on Sus, uh, Simone Weil, the sort of Christian socialist, um, and who sort of like displays a kind of superficial socialism for now, for the for the protagonist, um, and then you've got the character of Zenny, who's like a, a kind of aesthetic dilettante, like the top. He might like the surrealist, but not really. So I like Sar, but not really like being willing to eat shit, or like not really, really being willing to acknowledge the real to the extent that it that it is there. And then you've got his sort of uh, his his love match, Dirty Dorothea, who. Um, who is all about transgression, but too excessively, where it becomes linked to death, so much risk, so much uh, ill health, it becomes a sadomasochistic sort of affair um, and leads to sort of Trotman's impotence. Um, so you sort of see what stage there are kind of like, um, all right, the bourgeois are corrupt, that's why we want a revolution, but the revolutionary is a Puritan like um, who uh, it literally is acting out a kind of Christian Puritan structure to the point where uh, she does become perverse, but in disavowed ways that ultimately undermine the project. Then you've got someone in the arts who's like, I'm into the arts, I'm into communists, but it's all very superficial. And then you've got somebody who's into transgression who's so into it that there's no control. It's like um, they're, they're killing themselves. They're openly fantasizing about death. Then you've got the Nazi marching band, like this, this uh, outright or this far right kind of alternative that comes in and says, by the left, you're not going to get any satisfaction from them. They're more more austerity than the bourgeois who are crushing you in the middle. So you're going to come to the right, to the marching band, to the to the blonde dolls. And Chopman's final sort of moment at the train station is like watching these little blonde Aryan sort of dolls do their marching sort of things and thinking suddenly they look to him like grotesque monkeys jerking grotesque monkeys' penises. Like you say, we're sort of debunking him straight into the real that they're sort of parodying just like Trump comes out with his little twirling girls. He's parodying our desire, but in a way that speaks and captures us more or can capture us more than the corrupt bourgeois in the center or the Puritan left uh, will. And so that's sort of where we are 
today in that sort of style. The bourgeois is super corrupt in the middle. They're squeezing us again with more austerity. The left are still like think they're in the Me Too, Me Too era, acting Puritan about sexuality and the gays. It's only going to appeal to uh, to the drive so much. And then you've got the like the parody of the drive and the far right that seems to be doing in some ways better than the genuine left in um, solving the problem, which just stays in the middle as a crisis with that alternative that threatens to go on until uh, something really bad happens, which it could be seem- climate change. We or do, on Ukraine, take it to World War Three. Yeah. We do seem to have a propensity to stay in this cycle and then there's a big sort of energy, 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 and it's like, well, it has to burst. We have a war or we have a bust in the finance system or some form of minor collapse and we never learn anything. We're like, you know, then we finally have our rest, our breather, like we were talking about before, and then we go, let's, let's, no, this, this, you know, this bourgeoisie is different. This far-right person is different. This... Uh, fake socialist is different, right? Every single time. It's almost like we don't live long enough to, to, we, you know, we only live long enough to see the next cycle and no one's really got the energy to, we're, only, we're still recovering. So we don't have the energy to say, no, 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 don't do that. But we, but what's the alternative? That's the difficult thing. Cause the alternative, I guess, mm-hmm. is to really, uh, well, it's to look at the real, like we've been talking about, it's to admit yeah. to it. Yeah. <sighs> How do we how do we how do we look at the real? There you go. <laughs> That's a question. We try to we try to articulate it better, and we try to articulate better outlets for it in the in the arts. Yeah. So that when we back to politics, we're more happy to be exclusively rational there because we know as response is available for us when it's time for us for aesthetics for the arts. Um, we have the money to do it, and we have the. Um, their non-phobia or resentment towards sexuality to make the most of it. It's no point having all the freedom in the world. Let's go out and, like, be too afraid to actually connect it with anyone erotically because we're, you know, so full of hang-ups. So, yeah, or let's go out where we're ready for experiences but no one's got any money in their pocket and, you know, there's there's nowhere to go or um, – and we're so just destroyed by, by working life and mortgages and rents and – that uh, there's there's no surplus, there's no surplus to sort of to, to really look at, but um yeah, but I think I think books books like the ones that we've been engaging with today, which you know my own books have tried to sort of um, crystallize in certain ways, which I'm sure you know look, looking at your podcast with your fifteen thousand subscribers, I'm sure you're all doing that, uh um you know in in, in your own ways as well like engaging with text, engaging with philosophical discussions, theoretical discussions, trying to understand problems, trying to understand what the real of the problem is in order to posit solutions, uh, promote the sort of education of, of these possible solutions and um, and hope we can make a little step forward instead of taking 10 steps um, backwards. But who knows which way it will go. What's your, uh, what's your own next step forward? Are you thinking of writing another – you staying with Bataille for a little bit more or – are you, are you working on I think that? I will, yeah. I think I will. I'm sort of written the first two chapters. I usually write it as independent articles, which eventually become chapters of the book. Um, so the first two have been written on uh, Lacan and Bataille again, mm. but um, looking at different parts of Lacan and different parts of Bataille. So looking, for example, on Lacan's treatment of the perverse structure, which is more connected to the phallus, the mechanism of disavow, which comes out in seminars four and five in particular. And, you know, there's so much in Bataille that I never really got a chance to read in more detail as well. Like um, I want to do like a like I did with Story of the Eye and Blue of Noon in, in, in the book we've been discussing. I want to do it with my mother using the extra sort of uh, knowledge that I get from the current engagement with the perverse structure because the the relationship between, the relationship between the child and the mother there is, is very, very interesting, uh, um, the way the son acts as a kind of phallus for the mother. Um, but then also by the anaphallic bearer that, you know, is there, that actually penetrate the mother in this Oedipal moment. So it's pretty fascinating. And looking at a lot of uh, Bataille sort of uh, stuff from the atheology period as well, which I didn't get a chance to deal with in detail. So in the experience, I've written, a, I've written a chapter on that in relation to Lacan's notion of non-knowledge or in engagement with the idea of non-knowledge in um He's talking to Brick Wall's uh, talks that he gave at the Chapel of St. Anne, which came out about the same time as um, 
which he did at the same time as Seminar 19, which is the one just before Seminar 20 on feminine sexuality, the limits of love and knowledge. So plenty more things to explore uh, in, in this domain and uh, and the problems that we're dealing with are, aren't going away anywhere soon, so they, they need uh, further articulation, further discussion. Um, yeah, we'll be dead one day, so we need to pass on the knowledge so that uh, future generations can hopefully do take it further than we have um, and start hopefully somewhere better than we had, you know, born into the neoliberal horrors of the 80s, coming of age in the 90s, realising that the whole social welfare system has been stripped from us. Uh, it's It's been a um, hell of a ride for those of us who came of age in this sort of epoch. So for the future, hopefully they, uh, they have a little bit better than us. If they don't, well, we've tried to articulate what's wrong. We've tried to do what we can to uh, improve the understanding of them. Mm. Well, I'll be sure to put a link for uh, eroticizing aesthetics in the description below. But once again, Tim Themi, it's been a great conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.